welcome to the Blood Brothers podcast. We are joined this evening, um, myself and Mr. Rob Parker, by the wonderful Imran Mahmood, um, who is the author of You Don't Know Me, and also, um, I don't know, I know what I saw. I do know what I saw. I know what I saw. <laughs> Which Rob is holding <laughs> Which I'm holding up here. What a beauty. I don't know what I saw. That's a totally different book. <laughs> <laughs> How are you tonight, Imran? You okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing really good, actually. I'm really good. I'm feeling full of beans. In fact, you, you might be able to tell that I've still got makeup on. I don't know whether that looks with you can see that. Oh. Because I was doing something called an EPK, which I didn't know what this was, but it stands for electrical pr- Electronic Press Kit. Wow. Yeah. So when they, because they made um, You Don't Know Me into a TV thing, then they have all this kind of press stuff which goes on and I have to turn up and they record me answering questions and then they stick it on a thing which then goes off to the press. Amazing. I had no idea. Yeah, an electrical. Okay. electrical. Electri- yeah. yeah. E, e is the electrical. <laughs> That's Electri- crazy. I, I thought, no, um, you know, there is a gag in there for me to say something like, oh, I thought it was a Zoom filter that you had going on. But no, you it's actually... <laughs> yeah, it's actual makeup, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And how did it go today? Yeah, I mean, I, I what, but the thing is, I spoke for about an hour on, on stuff, you know, whatever they asked me, I just kind of rambled on. And right at the end of it, I said to the guy who was filming, I said, so, so what happens next? And he said, well, we've got you and we've got the screenwriter and we've got some of the actors... And we've recorded them all. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to set, you know, kind of finish it, t- touch it up, and then we're going to send it off. And I said, okay, so how much footage in the end will there be? He says, there'll be about three minutes in total. <laughs> 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 so I might get six seconds if I'm lucky. If I'm lucky. <laughs> you just get the bit where you go, hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's incredible, wow. isn't it? That- it's a, a. You wonder if the if the writing edit process should be the same. You know, we we write three hundred pages and then and then finally come out with twenty five page short story and go right. That's the nugget of it. Get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a kind of remember those things that you used to get when you were doing exams back in the dark ages, and you used to be able a to York get note. Yeah, you used to get like a York note, which would just <laughs> summarize the thing in five pages. They should do that for brilliant. all. Yeah, for all novels. Yeah. <laughs> Of I course mean, I've read Julius Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, like, then there'll be, like, incredibly successful um, sort of York Notes novelists, you know, who are brilliant <laughs> at doing 25 pages of a full, yeah. fulfilling story, you know? Yeah. I think that'd be and cool. then probably got really, really annoyed when that Shakespeare bridge lot came out and sort of made <laughs> them <laughs> on short Shakespearean plays. <laughs> Damn it. I've been answering oh. GCSE questions for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do have a brilliant um European history one of those. Um and I, I keep it because it's it's actually really good. Just smashes up European history in like bullet points. Like I'm back to, you know, it's great. I actually find that injection, the format, really, really interesting. Well, what, what can you tell us about the history of Europe? Which bit have you memorized? Which bit have I memorized? Um whoa, you know when you get thrown on the spot as quickly as that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, I saw I, it coming. I'm a big oh, fan. Of, oh, oh. Well, I'm not a big fan of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, but I mean, like at that period, I do find quite interesting. Yeah, well, um, we, we historians refer to him as the Archduke. So. The, well, yes, yeah. yeah. You, see, you see, if I if I hadn't have got my information from a Cliff Notes version, <laughs> I, I would have also known that. <laughs> I said we historians. Are you not a historian? No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's to give him his full unabridged title. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, well, uh, uh, there's so much to discuss. We've gone in uh, already. We've gone on tangents, which I am a big fan of. <laughs> um, and a huge creator of. Yeah. Um, well, yes. It's a, we, uh, I'm fascinated by um, I Know What I Saw, uh, just because, uh, I, I mean, you know, for those... Who, who haven't had haven't read it i mean it's uh it's that sort of it's that lovely story of that um did i witness it did i see it is it true nobody will believe me how do i prove it but with somebody who um in a sh- should be sort of well and and respected but has fallen on hard times and then you're just like right are, are you a reliable narrator are you not 
Naruto, what an interesting pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, I quite like that. Yeah. yeah. Like that. It's like, like when I call Piccadilly Circus Piccadilly. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's I'm, quite I'm a more like um, musical, Piccadilly. Like, Piccadilly yeah, Circus. If I go off on a tangent, I've got a really good, well, I say it's really good, you'll be the judge of it. I've got a story about <laughs> that where I was on a train to um, Oxford Crown Court and I just got off and I was hastening to court and this American family stopped me as I was rushing out and they said, uh, excuse me, can you tell me where the, where the shops are? And I said, yeah, yeah, just go into the, the, the town centre. And they said, well, is this not the town centre? And I said, no, this is the station. They said, no, but we know that. But is that over there? Is that not the town centre? I said, no, no, you've got to travel a little bit. And he said, so, so just tell me exactly where is Regent and where is Oxford? <laughs> <laughs> What you mean, Regent Street? And he went, Regent Street. And I said, where do you come from? <laughs> he says, well, we came from um, Piccadilly Circus and then we got on a train from Barrington. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bugger, I might have given them directions. Yeah, I, I, I think that was probably you, um, blood. Round <laughs> <rock>. Probably. <laughs> Yeah, no, so they it's a good job they didn't ask me how to get to Leicester, otherwise yeah. they would have oh, really yeah. been done. <laughs> <laughs> and the lesson is that, uh, always end with the word street or road and you'll be all right. Yeah, or square. <laughs> or oh, God. Exactly. Uh, I did a road be, trip with an American friend clear. in this country and uh, listening, I asked, I got to a point where I was asking him just to read out signs because it was super. <laughs> Luga Baruga was a big, big phase. Oh, Luga Baruga is a lovely place to learn. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. Loughborough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that. Anyway, this is, this is the most monumental digression. Wait, <laughs> We're Imran. not going to get anything done this hour, Imran, are we? stop <laughs> Was that a tiny, tiny can of Coke, or are no, you I've got, I've got huge, enormous? I'm, I've got huge hands. Um... <laughs> <laughs> the comic timing, listeners, was very good then. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a... <laughs> He's a giant. I think it's that man. No, I'm, I'm a kind of intellectual as well as a physical giant. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was just the intellectual side. No, no everything is skewed. <laughs> that um, is a full, that's a full size fold out map behind you, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. That is in fact that's probably most of London. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, man. A man is a giant. Anyway, the thing was, we were talking about the lovely construct you had created, and I know what I saw. I knew we hadn't started talking about it yet. Uh, but I can pr- I, I can foresee where you're going with this, and the thing about it is. Um, I in my, in my uh, first novel, you don't know, but we, we were dealing with a young black um, man who'd been accused of murder, and he was right on the margins of society because he was totally underprivileged. And here in I Know What I Saw, we've got somebody on the other end of the spectrum. He's middle aged, he's white, he is overprivileged, he has every advantage, and yet he finds himself from those heights reduced to kind of penury. And, and I just thought it'd be interesting to see whether, you know, if you're coming at it from both ends of the spectrum, if you end up in a place where the system um, isn't working for you, uh, how, how, how can you possibly inter, uh, I- interact with it, and the criminal justice system, when it's, you know, it's designed for other people, but designed to get you if you're on the fringes. Uh, but it's not really designed to work for you. It's just designed to work against you. And I, it was just one of those things that I, I thought might be interesting to explore. You know, if, if you took somebody who was otherwise highly literate in the culture and then just stripped that away from him and to see you know, h- how he would cope. There you go. Serious answer. Yeah. That was and then yeah. throw an impossible crime into the, into yeah. the mix. <laughs> well, you've got to have the impossible crime because otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> but, uh, I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of those locked room mysteries. Mm. Which, um, if, if, if I'm honest, uh, I didn't really know what what it was. I initially thought it was just about remember the, with that because there's a kind of locked room game, isn't there? There's a kind of where you get locked in a room and you have to solve the puzzle. Oh, like it, it, this um, yeah. thing that a lot of people I see lots of people do it online, and I've never done it myself. That kind yeah, of thing. yeah, that, well, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a locked room mystery, but apparently it's not. It's this. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was news to me that it was something to do with Agatha Christie and being on a train and, you know, <laughs> someone dying or, you know, in a country home. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite a big fan of the look, you know, this idea that, you know, something impossible has happened and it's a question of working out what's happened. And as you're doing that, as you're telling the story, you can, if you've got something that you want to kind of communicate and and in my case it was just a really I wanted to explore memory and identity and one feeds into the other and class and privilege but quite a nice way of doing it is if you can do a to, to tell a story and tell a kind of a slightly interesting story so that, so that they'll follow you um through that journey and kind of hear what you want to say about the other stuff I love that and I, I, I love that um the Fall from grace thing as a, as a as an uh, um, as an overall concept about what we're really worth. You know, when you strip away certain um, the, the the elements that that some people value, what we're really worth at the end of the day. Um, I find that's brilliant and, and such a great conceit to explore over a book. And it's another thing I, uh, that exemplifies why I love crime fiction because while you and you said it as well, Imran, that you've got to have the murder. But as long as you've got the crime, you can explore all sorts of different stuff in crime. And that is a very big question, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that um, you've hit on it, really, that issue about where we place value in a, a human being. You know, Martin Luther King said, you know, let's judge a man by the quality of his character or the whatever beautiful phrase he used uh, that I've just ruined. <laughs> The content, the content of his character, uh, rather than the colour of his skin. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one aspect of it. Um, if we are using this, it's some kind of social metric to judge people, you know, what does that make us? And, uh, you know, it's tempting to put everybody into groups because that's how our minds work. And we want to have categorizations for people but the problem is that it, that's never accurate it's great for big numbers and it's good for looking at statistics but if you put all homeless people into one category then what you're missing is you know the ultimate thing which is no two homeless people have the same circumstances which led them to that position that there yeah. are homeless people i know mm. who are in full-time work you know, they get up in the morning and they go to, to their jobs in retail, and but they're just not earning enough money to be able to afford accommodation. And they can't get local authority yeah. accommodation because they're not in priority needs. They can't get private accommodation, particularly in London, um, where it's, you know, you can't r rent a shed for less than, you know, 20 hours a week. Um, so what do they do? And they end up homeless and, you know, it's desperately sad. But I think, you know, mm. we're in a first world country and yet we are facing the problems of a third and you know, second world nation yeah i mean you just you only have to look at the um statistics for childhood poverty in the uk and then try and examine all of my family are over in south africa and you try and explain that we a relatively wealthy theoretically uncorrupt governmented country um so still have with the welfare state still have um that percentage of children in childhood poverty and just that i can't explain it don't ask me i don't have the wit or wherewithal to explain how we've got ourselves into this situation apart from greed and capitalism corruption but that is not I mean, the, the point is is that you know you kind of read um oxford graduate and you think and you make a, a certain set of character judgments about um elitism or ability or um you know what 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 do you have to lose and then you read homeless and you go okay this is an interesting character where do the police stand in taking that um Hello? that character seriously sorry that's my, my dog has epilepsy <laughs> and he has to have his tablet at 8 30 and i always forget uh, the I, was gonna, <laughs> I, think you're gonna, I think you're gonna end that sentence with and we've had to teach him how to use the phone <laughs> <laughs> And, and anyway, it was it's lovely talking to me. I've got to go. <laughs> Hollywood calling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a poor dog with a poor epilepsy. Don't take it. <laughs> I, I, I was going to have a dog in my book, but I, I, I was um, forbidden uh, a dog. Um, Zander, Zander was going to have a dog. In fact, I'd written him with a dog, and my editor said, you can't have a dog. And I said, why can't I have a dog? And she said, because if you have a dog 
they all want to. They're all going to want to know wh- where the dog is at all times, and yeah, at all times. And even if it's you like leave- Chekhov, it's like Chekhov's gun, isn't it? If you mention the dog in the beginning, you're going to have to kill it at the end or something. You know, it's just yeah, or, or kill it straight away, and then at least <laughs> <laughs> and eat it. And that's a bold way to open a, a novel, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because we spoke with um, with Mike Craven re- recently about this exact topic about how people get very upset about it. On page seventy two, you you mentioned that you know you've obviously neglected where the, the dog's location and his diet at this point. You know what? <laughs> yeah, well, I was telling the story, precise story, to Mike, and he said he st- he still gets people. Uh, you know, he's, he said he gets more emails about the dog and how the dog is, and what you know, and what's the condition <laughs> of the dog than he does about anything else. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not surprised. This is why, you know, I think we should all write more books about and for dog dogs. lovers. <laughs> and dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very important, particularly dogs who can use the phone. I mean, if you can teach them, you can probably teach it to read. I just, I just give him a little call and go, don't forget to take your tablets. And it's it, it, good. He pops them out of the packet himself. These little opposable claws. Um, to steer slightly back. Uh, this is like, it's literally like, are we, the, are we the, the evergreen guy in the pilot in the, in the Suey Canal, you know, trying to keep this conversation on track, but it's, it's intent on skewing sideways along the middle. Um, but he, he, even in trying to keep it on track, you veered wildly off track by giving us a, by giving us a boat like, analogy. Yeah. <laughs> you just went I, into the, but, but, we're about to shut down global trading for a yes. few weeks while we clear our barge from the side of the sewers. But but I tell you what, I can bring it back uh, by by telling you this that the character of Zander, uh, the tramp who's also um, an Oxbridge graduate, is based on a real person. Um, I met as a teenager in wow. Liverpool when I, yeah where I was growing up, and there was this guy, and he was. Um, we used to have to go to the libraries to to study um, because we didn't really have the we didn't have books at home we didn't have space really to study and so we'd get dispatched off to the local library and there was this guy then he was he was full kind of Osama beard and full heavy coat and you know smelled of ripe cabbage and but would sit there reading you know French literature or quantum physics or you know he was he was obviously highly intellectual and one day I was just sitting there doing some stuff and he came up to me and said um would you like to buy a French English dictionary and I said I'm studying French yes I would and he gave it to me at a kind of knockdown price and then he said do you want to buy any Moriac, Gide, Sartre, he said, I've got the Voltaire of Proust, I've got the lot and I said yes, and he he gave me some of this stuff again at a knockdown price. I wondered where he was keeping all these books. It didn't once occur to me that he was selling books at a knockdown price. We were in a library, and I was wondering where he was getting, <laughs> where he was keeping them, and where he was getting them from. <laughs> that that didn't Endless occur to supply. me. Supply. <laughs> <laughs> do anything. Let me just look on my <laughs> shelf. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, anyway, I looked inside the books and it had the crest of a local school in the covers. And I ended up speaking to one of the teachers at this school and they told me that this guy was a incredibly successful, very talented, very bright young man who went to Oxford or Cambridge, can't remember which. And... You know, he'd done four A's at A-level. He'd aced everything that he'd ever done. He'd got this fantastic job in the, in the city. And then he'd come back and he was destitute. And nobody really knew what the story was behind it. And I remember talking to him and asking him, you know, what's... I, I, because I was 15, I said, what's happened to you? And he said, I don't know what you mean. And he said, well... I said, well, you, you could be rich. <laughs> and he said... But I don't want to be. I want to be, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. I don't see why I should have to do what you want me to do and what everybody else wants for me. 
when I'm perfectly happy doing this. And I never ever understood that, not for years. It took me years, it stayed with me that um, whole experience. And I find myself wondering, the, you know, all of the time, what, you know, what was what the process was that led him to this conclusion. And, you know, whether there was something behind it, whether some awful tragedy had befallen him and that had changed his, his perspective to such an extent that, um, because I'm not saying he was wrong to think that or that he was right to, but just that, you know, wondered whether his perspective had shifted as a result of some um, event, which meant that this was what he now found more useful a lifestyle than anything else. It's interesting that, isn't it? I've got, uh, um, you know, uh, my uh, former, my goddaughter's boyfriend, um, both Oxbridge graduates now, but um, her, he, he was oh, he studied law and all of his um compatriots went into law and he was going into law and i think he did a sort of a single internship and then just thought i can't and went into social work in the east end instead and you know and and a lot of his um contemporaries were like well you're wasting your degree and you you know there was a there, he felt a lot of pressure to do to be in the city and to earn the buck and to and to get the big car and to have the big house and to and you know all of the trophy stuff and he was just like but I'm working hard and and helping real people and then you know on the flip side of that he's also being told to fuck off posho but either way <laughs> you know it's, it's, um, he, he he said there was an enormous amount of pressure on him to do something for the money to make value of the degree rather than rather than do something that made him personally happy or, or gave him any kind of feeling of, of fulfillment. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? That, that's how we measure success. We, there are, we, have, we have lots of different metrics by which we measure success. It can be you know, how much we earn, or it can be how um, well we progress in our given careers, whether we earn well or not. So, you know, you can... You, you're judged to be successful if you're a teacher or if you're you know a social, a social worker or a university lecturer or you know work in a hospital um you know because that's you know th th that's just one way of measuring at this, that we use one way of measuring value mm -hmm. but you know i i just wonder how valid that is anyway um yeah. whether what we do is a good measure of yeah. our morality how come, how come a teacher's allowed to sign your passport photo but your barman isn't whereas it most likely your your local landlord is going to know who you are for longer than any teacher that you might be able to get yeah. to sign a passport but <laughs> it's a value system that we place on on roles. Oh, yeah it's funny isn't it because i was i was um, talking to somebody who was who was talking about having a conversation with his partner about who did the more important job and I was just having this conversation then with myself and I thought, well, I wonder what, you know, what is more important? You know, I, I, I could I could get up in the morning and say, oh, my job is more important because I go to court and I save defendants from, you know, prison. So I'm protecting their liberty. But then, you know, somebody who works in a shop and who serves somebody, you know, a loaf of bread every morning and says hello to the, you know, local pensioner when she comes in for her a bottle of milk you know it, you think way, just as much isn't it yeah well, well that, it, in a way much more valuable because his his or her throughput you know the number of people that that person um mm. comes into contact with is much vaster than the numbers i come into contact with and help you know, I'll that was thrown person. into that was thrown into sharp relief when we had our key workers in the first couple of lockdowns yeah. of covid wasn't yeah. it because all of yeah. a sudden yeah we're talking delivery drivers, bin men, shelf stackers, supermarket workers. Obviously, the NHS and everybody else, but every other key worker out there was somebody who, up until that point, white collar had deemed as you know, blue collar working yeah. class. Or but all of a sudden, you oh, you're the backbone of the country, and you're like, yeah. Well, hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, well, we, can, um, we, we 
and, and we can pay you in applause because yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. well, but, that works but for not you, right? you. Yeah, you're happy not with that. You yeah. shelf stuff because only you people who work. Yeah, I, I think um, contentedness. Um, the, old, the the more I mature as a human being, which is uh, up for debate <laughs> as to whether that's happening at all. I mean, but I, thirteen I, now, so <laughs> yeah. I think contentedness <laughs> is very important on the entire metric. Whatever um, um, adds to your happiness and. Um, the happiness of those around you, not necessarily at the expense of your own happiness, but if you're happy, I think there's a higher, um, I do think that's much more important, um, yeah, yeah, I, whatever it, it is that you're doing. Um, yeah. I agree with that. I mean, in fact, Bhutan, I think, is, is has always been recorded as the happiest place in the world. And it's, you know, and it, relatively speaking, it's a very poor country, but, but its people are very happy because I suppose the you know, their approach to life and their philosophy on life is, is a very different thing from our philosophy, which, I mean, ours appears to be intrinsically linked to consumerism in one or another form. Mm. So we, you know, it was Hannibal Lecter, I think, in the, in the film who said, you know, what are the things that we covet? And we covet those things that we see. So if you're walking down the road and you see a Porsche or a Rolex or whatever it is you see, and that's the thing that drives your motivation and that motivation is the thing which you know gets you up in the morning then it's really still consumerism and the, the what kind of occurs to me later um occurred to me much later in life was that if, if you stop putting objects of desire in your own path then you you're bound to be much happier because while that object is there and unattained you've got misery and when you've attained it then you know because everything is subject to entropy in one or another shape or form you know you buy a car it's you know by next year it's going to have rusted or it's going to need cleaning or it's going to need servicing or it's going to need a new this or that and it's going to be worth half the amount that you Some paid for it driven into the side of it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah somebody will hit it or scratch it and you know it's going to cause you misery when you've got it and it's going to cause you misery when you haven't and that's because we're putting these idols in front of us where maybe you know, we should think a bit more carefully about our consumerism and maybe have our goals less kind of physical in that way. Yeah, yeah. And this, I mean, that's, that's interesting because, you know, I've had a, a number of friends who've had different fortunes across their life. And, you know, one of mine just said, I said, how are you coping with it all? You know, not having work and not doing it. And he said, you just cut your cloth a different way. Yeah. And you're like, it's such a nice way to look at it because you do. That's what that's what, what we should do and what we've always done rather than racking everything up on false credit just to keep up an appearance of success, yeah. which is false in the first place. Um, and yeah. you know, realistically just go, he, and he said, yeah, I'm quite happy. I'm living within my means. My means aren't what they were, but I'm living within them, which probably for the first time even... And yeah, you know, I think it's just one of those things where you take stock and go, what's it, what's important? What's the legacy? What's the mm. anyway? This mm. is uh, this is a, a, a far more philosophical yeah. discussion. <laughs> we were, we were just going to be talking about genre crime. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do have yeah. a more of a technical question actually. Yeah, uh, in yeah, my fire, yeah. Um because um, I. Uh, stylistically i really enjoyed reading this um and oh, it, no one of those um i found it super incisive and really direct and sharp and with a turn of phrase that um i i was the, excited me <laughs> i just re <laughs> I, I really buzzed reading it if you know what i mean oh, so you. i hope that came across right um yeah, Sean's no, looking no. at me with eyebrows <laughs> but i couldn't find it <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm raising I'm an eyebrow at like, the oh, excited I just can't wait to, to go, go for an early night with this book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really touched by that because that, because it was a different, for me, it was a really difficult book to write. Oh, really? But, yeah, I found it really, the, the funny thing is after uh, the first one, I spoke to a a journalist who was also a novelist and she said to me, oh, book two is going to be hard. And I said, no, no, it's not, it'll be fine. And she said, no, it's going to be really, really difficult. I said, no, 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 it'll be, it'll be fine. I've already got an idea. And she went, no, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be really, really horrible. I said, no, it'll be fine. And she went, I'm telling you, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be so difficult. And she was right. It was really hard. It was really hard. 
Yeah. Well, because um, I wanted to ask how how this style came about. Was it a natural thing for you, or did you? Yeah. Um, me, is this just like, uh, you, like this is how I'm going to write it, or did you start from one point and then was it a conscious decision to make it as tight as it reads? Yeah. So it's so the the style I didn't find difficult. So the, the style I found probably the easiest bit of it. And so it started with the characters. So I had I had this Oxbridge educated guy in his 40s or whatever and so his his language and his, the way that he uses words was going to be you know was going to hit a certain range anyway and then what i had to try and do is to remember that he's not speaking very much out loud because he's he's you know by himself and he's living on the streets and his occasion to to kind of speak is very narrow so you know, ha, you know what would that do to his kind of pattern of speech? And I thought it might uh, make it quite concertinaed and quite concise and rapid fire in some ways, maybe a little bit disjointed from time to time as his mind flits from one subject to the next. Uh, particularly if he's been there, uh, you know, where his kind of consciousness is slightly corroded by exposure to the elements. So, so that's what, what I was doing. I was putting myself in his head and, you know, thought, you know, if this was me, there would be this, because he's quite a literary guy and his parents are academics and his mother's fairly artistic. And I thought, yeah, there are going to be those flashes of, kind of beauty in the way that he observes things and the way that he uses language. And then at the same time, there's going to be this, you know, it, it's going to hit hard up against reality because... Yes, he's had that those tools in his life, but also he's 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 living on the ground, mm. and you know, and that's going to do something to his perspective. So I just wanted to kind of mash those two together, and it probably hasn't worked as I wanted it to. Oh, but, um, yeah, I think it works great, <laughs> and that's fa yeah. fascinating to hear that as well. Um, we actually we this leads us on to a um, a Twitter question actually that yeah. we have for you. Um, which comes from uh, the wonderful Con Frankowski. Uh, hello, Con, who is a, hello, uh, uh, yeah, top man, long-term listener. Yeah, 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 love Con. Um, he asks, in the world of literature, we saw many lawyers becoming writers, like Franz Kafka or John Grisham, or our very own Tony Kent and Nadine Matheson. Does lawyer training and learning very clear communication, both verbal and written, help formulating a storytelling style? Hmm. Well, for me, as a because I'm a jewelry um, advocate, um, when I was going through my training, my, my old people master said to me, "Look, if if you're going to um, recite facts at a jewelry, they're going to fall asleep, and the ones who are awake aren't really going to pay attention, and you're going to have wasted an opportunity. And what you really want to do, and you've got twenty minutes to do it, is you want to tell them everything, but you want to tell them everything in a way that's going to stick." And a story is the best way to do it. And the thing about storytelling or in the oral tradition is that you're blending in, uh, in a jewelry speech, you're blending a number of arguments, as ethical arguments, logical arguments, and emotional arguments, and, you, and you're weaving them all together. And when you're delivering that, you, you're trying to do it in such a way where you are also trying to be persuasive. So you're so there's a lot going on, and you've got a short time in which to do it. So so yes, it facilitates the idea of story because you're using story to carry the message, and you know in a novel that's what you're doing. But in the oral tradition, you're using different beat patterns. Um, they talk about the rule of three when you're doing um, a persuasive speech. Um, so you know you'll you hear Obama do it when he does when he was doing his speeches that he'll say this is a and b and c <laughs> and he'll develop this rhythm martin luther king obviously did it and all the great orators do it so you know you've got that there in the background but you it doesn't translate exactly um in in novel writing because it's a much more layered approach you've got to lay the groundwork slowly so it, yeah, it's like taking a 20 minute speech. In fact, my book one, you don't know me, was a speech. The whole thing's a speech, but I've taken a, a 20 minute speech and spread it across 90,000 words. Um, but it's, you know, 
it's it's a different discipline, and I, I imagine the yeah it's some uh, t- to begin with when I was writing some of the, some of the bits of um, book one, my agent would say, and would change the way in which I express something, um, and she said, oh, "Look, you're using it's quite passive," and I was using passive voice a lot, but that's because when you're at the bar in court, everybody speaks in passive voice and it uses, they, everybody uses quite archaic way mm-hmm. of speaking. And they'll say something like, um, and I was looking for inspiration and inspiration came for none or you know, something <laughs> like that. And, you know, and it, it works on your feet in front of a, an ancient judge with an ancient opponent but it doesn't work when you're talking to everyone else so yeah i mean it's no it's it, 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 it's it's difficult to kind of shake that off but once yeah. you've shaken it off and you realize that you're not writing an, adv- an, an advice on evidence <laughs> <laughs> then yes it can be useful to have the tools of the kind of construction kind of and you know, to deliver the eight the sentence Cons- uh, exactly as I'm not doing concisely <laughs> and meaning. Whenever, whenever one tries, one fails. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's I think there's something to be said for um, uh, my uh, my Scottish friend when I told him I was an author way way back when he said uh, so you basically tell lies for a living <laughs> and I think there's uh, you know I was like well that's a bit of a harsh way of putting it I do make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's something to be said for training your brain and constructing an argument and being able to make it plausible, um, which lends itself well, especially to crime writing, is to be able to say, well, um, and, and, and it, it, it's that um, the creation of doubt, which creates the bigger story, isn't it? Which, uh, you know, I think that those in legal practice are very, very clued up on. It's just to be able to create a shadow of doubt um, and, and, and lead the reader down a different path, make it feel plausible, vaguely, realistic. It's interesting you should say that because that definitely does, I think, feed into the style, my style, because you know, so there are, you've got those writers like Mike Craven who write these you know, very kind of intricate and flamboyant uh, stories. Yeah, you know, he's got twenty James Bonds in the in the latest one in the April, <laughs> and I, I'm totally in awe of that kind of imagine imagination, the power of imagination he's got. When I write, I try, I tend to do things which feel realistic, like in the kind of mundane sense, because I'm always trying to make the thing plausible. And the reason for that probably is when I'm saying to a jury. His fingerprints were on the outside of the window, not because he was burgling it, but because he was checking to see if everybody was okay. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to do it in such a way that it feels plausible. Mm. Try not it, to laugh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if it doesn't, and I, that's what I sometimes struggle with that in in the novels, where I, you know, if I'm writing about somebody being killed for a, you know a particular high falutin reason, then it's gonna it, it, it's gonna make. It, to me, it's going to feel re- possible and real. Mm. Otherwise, I'll just, otherwise, I find it hard to stick it down on paper. That's interesting. Um, just very um, slightly, I was reading. Uh, you know, we do do research on this, um, or well, we try to. Um, but <laughs> middle te- middle temple is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I um, uh, I had a, um, one hell of an evening at Middle Temple once. Wow. Yeah. What do you, what do you um, do? <laughs> Uh, and is this is this broadcastable? And it's for a whole is your one hell of an of evening? It was it three was, Guinnesses I, honestly, and a cup of cocoa. <laughs> it was. I was. I was fascinated and in awe um, the entire time <laughs> I was there. Um, but they were wonderful with me, um, and it was a very late event. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. But are events usually like that? <laughs> so, if you were in Middle Temple Hall. With the great big vaulted ceilings, and yes, that's the one, yeah. the Harry Potter one, yeah. yeah so, it, so there they have so you have formal dining, which are the dinners that you have to do in order to qualify. Mm. If you believe that, you have to eat dinners in order to qualify. It's not the only <laughs> thing you have to do, but you do have to eat 
a certain you did a certain <laughs> number of dinners in a term. Anyway, and so they have those. They have those nights, and then they have revels, and they have kind of speakers on, and there's loads of things they, they do. One of the things that they did was something called mixed dining, and mixed dining doesn't mean boys and girls. It means plebs like me, and the judges all mix. And you, if you know you're a, a student, and you can meet the judges and so on. Now, there's a, there are different classes of judges. You have district judges, you have high court judges, and crown court judges. And there is a class of a judge called a master, and they sit in the high court, a bit like a district judge, but they are called master, master Tennyson or master whatever. And so we were, as a student, we were kind of all going around mingling, and a friend of mine was talking to, <laughs> was talking to a judge. And she was in hysterics and it was late on in the evening and she dr drank a bottle of port. And she was in hysterics and I walked over and I witnessed this conversation where she said to him, she said to him, because the judges all had cards with their names on. And as I walked over, she said, this is master of the high court. This is master Bates. And she handed me his card. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me, I think I'd just call him Jim. And then from that point <laughs> onwards, it just descended. So that every table that we went on, she was just making kind of any <laughs> and drinking <laughs> bottles of port from one place to the other. There was so a lot of was, port. I do yeah, remember the port. Yeah, a lot of port. And you've got to pass it in a particular direction. You've got to, mm. pass it the, uh, <laughs> you've got to sit in a mess, which is a kind of a, <clears throat> a thing of four. Yes. You can't talk to the other mess unless you get permission from the head of their mess and the head of their mess. It's, it's, it, it, yeah. yeah. I, I was a plus one at whatever oh, we, event it was. Um, so um, my eyes were very wide. Um, but I, I had a whale of a time. <laughs> Absolute whale of a time. Well, if you're, as soon as it opens, if you're ever around, either of you, um, then just give us a shout and I'll take you for lunch. They have nice lunches there. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. I, def I would love to, yeah, the, like the triumphant return to Middle Temple after all yeah, these years. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do it without all of the craziness. We'll just have lunch. But um, <laughs> yeah, then we'll see how you behave. And if you behave badly enough, then we can do the proper <laughs> thing at night one day. <laughs> we start trying to pass the port to the right. People <laughs> might yeah, it's not good. That, the, what, the thing with the port is I, I had never had port. And um, I felt like, you know, as it was being passed, I felt like, right, I've got to have it. You know, I felt like it was like... As the if it deal, was the blood like... of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought, I thought I'd thought i get a, a, a slap wrist if I didn't take it. So I was like, right, okay, yeah, we have to keep, yeah, keep it coming. <laughs> Did you just keep doing it as a yeah, shock? Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. thought like that was the done thing. Like, <laughs> um, But no, I, um, amazing. An amazing tradition as well, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it's steeped in it. In fact, um, on the walls, um, depending on where you're sitting, behind you or in front of you, they have all these shields and the, the stained glass um, with, with the shields kind of family crests. And the fact there are family crests for a family called the Hydes, and there's one next to it for the Jekylls. And that's where he got the names Jekyll and Hyde from. Oh, mm. I, I, love I love this stuff. Love that's it. so cool. Bringing us neatly back to literature. Yes! <laughs> Segway City. I love it when a Segway comes back round. Super. Yeah, unless you're standing on it and you've leaned back a little bit, <laughs> then you start spinning. I couldn't do one then. And that was an interesting thing, actually, because the inventor of the Segway died on a Segway. No. Yeah, yeah. He he drove off the edge of a accidentally <laughs> went off the edge of a cliff. It can't be. In a, honestly, in a Segway. And the, the really creepy thing about it is, he had to invent the thing which was later going to kill him. That's that's no, so strange. Really. There's no, a really. there's a book in that as well that's about suicide. taking an um technically yeah. suicide yeah. by invention. No yeah. weird. I mean he wasn't deliberate, it was accidental, and that was the thing. That he ended up creating the thing which ended up killing him. I suppose a lot of early pilots yeah, will have done the same thing. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> yes, but never quite as you know, as contemporary as the segue. Yeah, I mean, very dramatic, that. I mean... Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a why, very... why, why was he driving he went, a Segway yeah. on a cliff edge? <laughs> 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 it's 
they don't look like they're compatible for that kind of environment. <laughs> well, I have to say, it may not have been a cliff, but he did he did kill himself um, by driving yeah. a Segway off uh, uh, off the edge of something. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Do you think um, old Clive Sinclair was was lucky to not do that in the C5? The C5s you can still buy those off uh, eBay. Um, yeah, and easily die under a bus in one. Yeah. Way. Yeah, I, it would be quite nice to have one you know, for the garden, just to have a little whiz around. Just put, just put some little shears on it, and it can yeah. cut the grass. <laughs> I quite like those. Yeah, right um, those just How speaking. big is your garden? <laughs> <laughs> About the size of a C for a C5. <laughs> Um, I was on eBay recently um, trying to work out how much it would cost to buy one of those. You know, those transport vehicles to and from prison. Um, oh, like the a, like the a, one that have got all the cells in. Yeah, and then like as I was looking like at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, five grand would get you a half decent one. And I'm looking at the thing like, wow, I could get one of them for the family. <laughs> <laughs> have cells in the back, just all the kids, <laughs> the kids all. I've got three of them, Imran. So um, right, it'd be they great. Like them. they'd all just have a cell each. I'd put a, a, like um, a, a, they'd have their tablets in there. We wouldn't hear from them. It'd be amazing. I thought we were business. going to come full circle to you know your mobile library. <laughs> library well, when he, Steve. When you said I've got three of them, you, are you talking wives or? Um... <laughs> I'm not talking about wives or um, decommissioned uh, police vehicles either. Children. He has three children. Children. Three, three children. children. Yes. Yeah. Oh Apparently, God. all need to be detained whilst being transported. I mean, I'm worried you can hear them right now because I can hear them above me right now. They're, you know, we we said you can stay up and, until Daddy's finished and you can watch Harry Potter. And there is not a lot of Harry Potter going on up above me. Um, <laughs> unless it's a, it blossomed into a 4D interactive screening somehow. Um, yeah, they're looking for the snitch. Yeah, that uh, sounds like it. Sounds like it. Um, what, what, what we, right, how do we get this back on track? <laughs> you know what's happened? We don't have Chris McDonald. Oh, he's usually the, the yes, the brain, the us, voice of reason. He brings us on. Yeah. He brings us back on. He does. I'm, I want. I wanted to ask you. Well, you've touched on it already um, about um, the difficulty of the second novel. But was there additional pressure because of the accolades thrown at the first? Mm. And you know, you there was, you were sort of glass bell nominate, uh, shortlisted, and uh, you know, among the CWA long lists. And uh, it, it, did you kind of go, ooh, right? Have I ever <laughs> got to step up another level here? And well the, well, the thing was that um, I had a one book deal for that, so I did. So, so the second book I was writing not under contract, and um, I, effectively I, I wrote it on spec, and so I wrote it, and then I was um, casting around looking for a publisher. So, in in the sense that, yeah, I had to find somebody to 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 buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there was quite a lot of pressure. Um, but in terms of writing it, it th the nice thing about You Don't Know Me was that it was kind of conceptually kind of new. I hadn't seen anything like it where, you, where, the, where the entire book was a speech. I hadn't seen anything which was quite like that. Um, so, you know, whether it's a gimmick or whether, <laughs> whether it's, <laughs> it's something else. So, th so that it was quite nice to have that. And it was pretty impossible to come up with something similar you know, as a kind of conceit. Um, so there was a bit of pressure there. Um, but kind of broadly, no, I just wanted to to, to write the story which I, it was in my head and get it and get it out there. And I was just thrilled when I got the deal from Raven because it meant that, uh, you know, I, I knew then that people would um, read it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. really, that's, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the narcissist narcissism of, of writing isn't it is that you think <laughs> that the thing that you wrote should be read by other people i mean it's, <laughs> it's awful, the narcissism and the terror isn't it <laughs> i want everybody to read it but i don't want anybody to read it and tell me that they're reading it <laughs> yeah I, I, and i want everybody to read it and i don't want anybody not to like it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, yeah which is cr which is crazy because you know, even Harry Potter is disliked by some people. God, yeah, me and, presently, and, and <laughs> Rob's children clearly. Yeah, me right now. I, I hate the thing. 
<laughs> rioting around. I know. <laughs> there will be some. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go upstairs like Basil Fawlty in a bit. Right. <laughs> there will be some scurrying off into bedrooms going on. I'm not, I'm only joking. I'm soft as anything. Really. <laughs> this is why they're doing it because they know they'll get away with it. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> exactly. Precisely. Yes. Um, uh, that that uh, that's about reviews, though, isn't it? You mentioned about you know like um, you should like it. How do you um, feel about uh, mighty one star reviews, Imran? Um, if they if they're quite amusing, I don't, <laughs> I don't mind. Um, it's the the ones I really hate are. I ordered this book and oh. it came, and the pages were bent over one star. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Is, is, well, I, I think people don't realise that you, you've spent two years or three years or five years writing a book, hundreds, thousands of hours, you know, crafting it, and then giving it away for a pound or six pounds or five, you know, it's, yeah. that, that they can then, you know, ruin your entire kind of prospects with the book <laughs> just by saying it didn't arrive on time. Or... Oh, it's that thing of not being, people not being able to separate product from concept. Yeah, because you know, they, it's because like they, people yeah, going, they, well, why would, or looking at Jackson Pollock and going, well, my three year old could do that. And you're like, well, the cow. Yeah. <laughs> so, fuck off. <laughs> and, and, Rob, and more importantly, I've, I've, been, I've been meaning to ask Rob if he's drinking his own urine, Bear Grill style, this entire podcast. Got right down to the bottom of it. Out. I always uh, try, whenever I've got a, a podcast on, I always try and eat, a, eat, <laughs> drink a full litre of Bear's urine while I'm. Uh, <laughs> Just sits the spot. Good well, note. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. On that note, it's been lovely testing. Giant Coke. <laughs> Giant Coke. Yeah, yeah I, that, that's, that, this is, I'm a normal, you know, we've got um, Your normal opposite size. drinks. Yeah. No, no, this is like a large size. We've got opposite size perspective, <laughs> like Lord of the Rings movie on the thing. I'm quite happy. Thanks very much. Um, anyway. We, what are you reading at the minute, Imran? Oh, I am reading two things. One of the things I'm reading is called The Leopard um, by Giuseppe Lampudeza, which is an Italian... It's, it's it's like a kind of... I didn't know this, but it's a kind of... I think it's the most widely sold Italian book in the last 50 years or something. And it's... I'm, I'm reading it because it was recommended to me. And at the moment, I'm finding it it's just so hard to read really <laughs> yeah it's really a difficult read i'm really <laughs> struggling with it but because it was recommended to me i feel like i should see it through yeah. and just and just finish it off so that's the kind of yeah that's the punishment read uh, but on the, on the non-punishment side i am reading vaseem khan's written um the second in his um Persis Wadia, Inspector Persis Wadia series. So I'm reading that, that. He sent me an advanced copy and it's called A Dying Day. That's awesome. brilliant. And it's in Fabulous. true golden era style. It's yeah. just fantastically done. And I am reading Watch Her Fall by Erin Kelly. Who, which oh, is yeah. About, yeah, which is also spectacular. I've got Steve Kavanagh's new book, which is next oh, yes. on the list. Oh, sneaky. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've got a, and Dorothy Kimpson just sent me her, her new one as well. So I've got a lot of brilliant stuff to read as soon as I can get through the kind of really tedious thing that I started to <laughs> now feel as if I have one, to. One must flagellate oneself with a leopard before one can enjoy a cavernor. <laughs> yeah, it does sound a bit like a flagellation. It does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, literary. It, 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 I mean, it kind of is. And. I think that you can't spend your whole life eating cherry pie. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to have a bit of broccoli. Otherwise, you know, you, you'll die of diabetes. This is what we tell our children. And so we yeah. must. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that must that has to be the same with, with literature. You've got to read some stuff which is good for you, even though it tastes like shit. <laughs> And, and the and t-shirt slogan was born. Exactly. <laughs> there's a cover quote if ever they need one. Yes, yeah. <laughs> what, what are you reading, Sean? Have you got time uh, for just, reading in the middle of moving house and all this? Uh, well, I, uh, as you can see, I've unpacked. 
I moved yes, down you're in. And ran to, yeah. uh, uh, 15 around. copies of each book. Yeah, You've got three books. books. Got 15. Placed on the shelf. <laughs> Um, I've just I, I'm not I'm not reading for pleasure because fuck knows where that box is, but um, I have just finished the last um, tweakly draft of um, I'll Pray When I'm Dying by Mr. Stephen Gold. Ah. Is uh, if, Imran? If you haven't come across him, he he's um, a much undersold, uh, probably by my own self, um, author who is just the most. It, it makes you cry how um, beautifully constructed his sentences are. And, um, oh, send me, it, send me, send me the details. I'll, yeah, I will. I'll, 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 send you, like I'll send you a couple of copies of his. Um, his, his latest, I'll pray when I'm dying, is a story of um, a bad man getting worse. Um, and, it, and it really tackles, it's one of the only books I've seen where a central character is both uh, an unpleasant person, but uh, suffers from extreme... Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and um and it's so beautifully told and he's a, he's really poetic in the way he does it so uh, yeah i'll send you i'll send you some copies oh, that's i find that it. that's kind of excited me the idea of having to read that yeah, being able to read that that's i find that really exciting when, when it's yeah when and he's um it's just everything from his dedication is um this book is dedicated to those who count and it's even spaced that way, and it's that repetition of the counting and the one to yeah. heaven and the touch, 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 and the touch wood, and it's just the the most beautifully constructed. Talking about annoying to love him, but you have to. Kind of yeah, I, I um, you that was uh, truthfully that is what I'm reading at the moment, which I'm just finishing off. It's oh. it's superb, um, and I think it's one of those which is actually it's um, it's an achievement. This you know, it's not just um. Uh, the a... next thing he's bought out, it's an achievement. It's the, oh, wow. the skill with which this has been done. I, honestly, he's, for me, you know, um, he's one of the most exciting voices out there. I just yeah. think he is. Yeah, I agree. Talking but, um, about exciting books, the, the one I read recently, which is, which I was really excited by, is a book which um, as, and my old editor said to me, you've got to read this book. It's a hell of a book. And I said, okay, I will read it. Um, I said, what's it called? And he said, no, no, it's called A Hell of a Book. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and, it, and it is called A Hell of a Book. And, but it's beautiful. It's oh, wow. Beautiful, yeah, it's a beautifully written... I'm writing it down. America, it's Jason Mott, um, you know, who's you know, a highly talented author you know, before this book. Uh, but this book, it's just incre- incredible. It's... I don't know whether you ever read The Sellout, which you know, won the Booker, but this is like that, but good. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't think much of the Booker Prize winner. I thought it was, Mm-mm. you know, tedious and parts of it were just, you know, it was, it was vague and not that clear. Was this tackles the same subject matter and it does it with charm and wit and humour and it's a really compelling read. It's Fabulous. brilliant. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Amazingly as well, um, that book, hell of a book, and um, I'll Pray When I'm Dying is um, are both out on the same day. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Probably good uh, fellows, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't we? I love it when uh, a plan t- comes together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, thank God for Hannibal Le- No, not Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal, Hannibal, Le- Hannibal, <laughs> Hannibal from the 18th. Yes, the yes. Journey. Thank you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's been uh, so great to hang out with you tonight, Imran. Well, I feel like we've talked about everything and nothing. <laughs> it's been my utter pleasure. And if all your podcasts are like this, I'm definitely not going to listen to any more. <laughs> yeah, I think you should. <laughs> but I think other people should. <laughs> um, yeah, and everyone, um, I know what I saw uh, is absolutely brilliant. It's razor sharp. Uh, go and buy it immediately, please. Uh, thank you very much. Please do. Also. I don't know what I saw is not a book. I <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, when I uh, when I did the book un- kind of box opening hoopla, my daughter was in it, and I held it up and she read it. She went, "I know what I was." <laughs> 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 and, then my, and then my wife said, "Oh, you found the title for your next book." <laughs> yes, there you go. And that's even more of an ex- existential <laughs> crisis, isn't yeah. it? I know what I was. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs>
<sighs> Trust the kids to yeah. throw a crisis into a book opening. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you. It's, it's been by far the most fun I've had in, you know, hours. Um, in <laughs> literal, <laughs> literal an hour and a half. It's, it's the most fun I've had in an hour and a half. <laughs> well, um, and we'll see you hopefully soon out and about on the circuit. And um, yeah, fingers yeah, crossed. Thanks, so. fingers well, crossed. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank, thank you, you so much. Really, really, really enjoyed it. Oh, no, it's been low. Yeah, as I'm sure you would. <laughs> <laughs> My cheeks are sore. <laughs> I'm pressing stop. I got it. <laughs> Calling it. <laughs>